All right. Welcome. This is Mark Gabrielski, and I'm Will, Will Huber. And um, Will, I'm going to not steal your line. Yeah, but, so uh, Mark, Mark and I are what we call frenemies. We work for competitive organizations, right? We both work for VMware Partners, but uh, we're we friends compete. today. We compete often. <laughs> so, but you know what? We, all, we can both agree on one of these messages uh, that uh, whenever we're designing infrastructure, in this case specifically, our VMware infrastructure, we have this one key thing that we want to make sure uh, that we're going to share with you. And I mean, if you want to take the lead on that. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're going to talk today a little bit about um, vSphere lifecycle management. How many people here really love lifecycle managing ESXi hosts? Raise of hands. A couple. Uh, how many are you using, liars. How many are you using the new v, uh, vSphere lifecycle Are still using VUM or are you using LCM? LCMs? LCM or VUM? Couple. How about the uh, uh, VUMs? Still so bumps. that means the rest of you don't update your hosts. Awesome. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. Cool. So um, we're, we're going to talk about lifecycle management of ESXi hosts, and in particular, sort of the transition from VUM into VLCM, and, and how that might um, change some of the rules in terms of how we think about cluster design, for some new constraints that, we're, that, we're, that are introduced with that. Um, and so if we go back to sort of just to sort of play the, the history reel, um, we've been managing ESXi hosts using vCenter Update Manager basically since what, vSphere 4, I think, was when it uh, came vSphere out? vSphere 4.0, yeah. So, um, and a lot of our customers, a lot of your customers, my customers, are still using VUM today. Clearly, some here in the audience are also doing that. Um, but in, in you know, vSphere 7, uh, we introduced, you sort of see this new sort of icon here, which is the new feature for uh, vSphere, vSphere Lifecycle Manager, I think it's the, officially called. And I'm just going to go LCM because there's like seven v LCM products, but it's VLCM, vCenter LCM. And so, LCM. so VLCM is sort of the go forward, it's the soon to be replacement of VUM. Um, and it's sort of this new unified approach to handling uh, version upgrades and patches, not just for ESXi, but also incorporating things like driver updates and, and firmware updates as well. And the thing that's important to know is that it's officially deprecated in vSphere 8 um, and will be removed entirely in the next version of, uh, of vSphere. So if you haven't made the transition from VUM into VLCM, it's probably a good time to start thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and there's actually the, uh, the link to the, the deprecation notice. Um, but we're, again, we're sort of using this as a catalyst to have a broader you know, uh, vSphere cluster design conversation. So Mark's going to get into, he'll, he'll talk about the new LCM, but then we're also going to talk about things like HA, DRS, um, and then aligning cluster design principles to business concepts uh, and the workloads that, that, um, that, you, that you run on them. So Mark, go ahead. So yeah, and I mean, really, because of that deprecation, I just think it's really important to share with folks that you know, the whole change and what you have to be aware of as you design your clusters. Because if you're like me, we mix and match hardware and hosts and different generations of servers as our infrastructure goes. And you'll see that we're going to have a new set of constraints that are going to bring that to light. And if you've never played with vRealize, uh, the, this lifecycle management component, the LCM, uh, there's other sessions here that go into the particulars. We're just highlighting some of it that drives this new constraint. Uh, but you'll see here, essentially, what we're going to do when we're using image-based management, which is the LCM point uh, purpose. Uh, you have to pick a version of ESX, which is not a big deal, right? We usually install a version of ESX on our hosts. But then we can see that we got a second line item there where we're going to actually have to pick and choose what our vendor add-ons are going to be for this cluster. So this is uh, very akin to you going to the VMware website and downloading the HP ISO or the Dell ISO, the Cisco ISO, so you have all the drivers. Essentially, this is what we're doing here, is we're building that recipe and that image ourselves. Uh, and then, you, you know, it's not just you know, which uh, HP release here that I've got highlighted, but then you have to pick the version that's going to be appropriate for the version of vSphere. And they kind of line up the names, so it makes sense, but you have to be aware of that. And then, you know, so while we end up with those first two options, we also have a third option here, which is actually really cool. Um, so I'm a big HP guy, right? So I use OneView and I do my firmware management in that manner. Uh, from the uh, OneView side of things, and I you know, align that with my vSphere side of the world. Well, now we're going to be able to do firmware updates as well as our software updates all in one step, right? We're going to define what the actual recipe is, and we're going to apply that to the hosts in the cluster. Well, what's the catch? Uh, the catch <laughs> is 
do you see anywhere on the screen where I can say, well, I've got some Dell servers and I've got some HP servers, or I've got some Gen 8 servers and some Gen 10 servers? You, there's going to be a limitation. You can apply one set of firmware versions and drivers and form a single recipe. So now, where we've been steered, based on this constraint, is every one of your clusters should be homogeneous. Same make and model, uh, same set of drivers and compatibilities. Because you can only apply one set of drivers and firmware to that, that really just, you have to be aware of this as you're buying hardware. And, and even more specifically, like, down to like, NIC versions and storage adapters and all those types of things, you need to have that consistency now that's, so you don't run into problems. And it's always been a best practice, yeah. right? But we, we've been pretty lax, right? Best practice is just a best practice. It's not the rule of law. So we've always been able to deviate slightly from that. I'm curious, anybody here mix and match host types in your clusters or no? You're a little bit? For scale? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Implement now, three years later, add more. So again, this could be a problem, right? And we're going to get to that and how we might just address that. May not be what you want to hear, but at least we're going to call it out, all right? <laughs> so again, with vendor add-ons, you have to choose those. You don't have to choose to integrate your firmware delivery with that. That would be HP OneView, Dell Open Manage, or whatnot. Those are going to be the components that you'd have to integrate to also push the firmware. So it does provide some benefits, uh, but you just have to be aware of that. So really, the whole reason, this is a really important topic in my mind, and I've been pretty vocal about that, is anything you're buying now is going to live for three to five, six years, right? vSphere 9 is going to be out, and that's going to be the only way you're going to be able to manage and maintain and patch your hosts, because vSphere 9 will not have Update Manager and the baselines. That will not be in the software. So if you're not already ready to do this, you're going to have to go to vSphere 9 Upgrade and start from scratch and figure it out, rebuild your clusters, redesign on the fly. So I wanted to give you all some time well ahead of this just to, just to start thinking about that and implementing it now as you're moving forward. And you know, with some of the normal cluster stuff, I mean, well, every one of our, your customers is the same as mine. Basically, we use all of these things, right? We take all of these things now for granted. We don't even appreciate HA and DRS, EVC mode, uh, right? So, yeah, we're still going to get the same things out of this, right? We're still going to go ahead, we're going to get our HA mode, right? We're going to expect that we're turning it on, and we're actually turning on admission control, right? Because we want to make sure we have a plus one cluster in our on-prem infrastructures, so we can do maintenance and HA events and cover that, right? Uh, most of us do this, right? This is the default setting. Just calling it out since we're talking cluster design, this lower setting right down there, please pay attention to what I had circled there. The default setting actually is 100%, not 0%. 100%, uh, if, if you leave it at the default, will not issue a warning if you're rolling out too many VMs. If you change that to a zero, it will warn you that you're rolling out too many VMs that you can safely protect. Right? So to me, that's just one of the easy things that we can just add to this, this content, because this is going to be all about building our clusters. And the same is true with DRS, right? We all really appreciate DRS and what it does for us. Um, and, you know, turning it on fully automated, that's what we all want uh, for, the, for the cluster setting. We can individually change individual VM settings, but when we actually get down to it, right, in the center there, been around since, I think, version 7. Forgive me if I'm, you know, 6.7 or 7.0, but if you ever had a conversation, which Will's going to talk about this in a few minutes, when we're designing our clusters to meet at SLA, we've all heard of CPU over subscription, right? CPU ready time, not something we want, right? We can control how many CPUs we're allowing to oversubscribe by. Uh, and again, this has been there for quite a few years already, and it's just a huge thing. Um, and yep, again, just highlighting. Even though we set those preferred settings at the cluster level, we can always override the individual virtual machines. So EVC mode. Uh, once version 6 of ESX was released at vSphere 6, uh, they change the way it works, and I totally roll out EVC mode everywhere. Hopefully you do as well. There are some benefits. Um, but just please, if you do turn it on, make sure you don't leave it at the default, right? If you notice that top choice of Memron, um, I don't even bother looking it up. I'm just, I assume that's 15, 18-year-old CPU instructions. Please upgrade your EVC mode and apply something and take advantage of all your uh, instructions that you've paid for. And the whole reason I bring up EVC mode 
This is what most of us have probably done, right? So it, just throw something at me if you agree or have done this stuff, right? But I'm just going to have my simple example cluster here, right? Three nodes, just simple to draw. But hey, it's time for me to scale and add a node. It's been three years, so no big deal. I buy a new host, ready to start throwing it in. And unfortunately, as you called it out, right, the NICs, the CPUs, they're all different, right? So that's going to change the characteristics of that host, right? It's still going to fit in the cluster, right? It's an Intel, you know, Intel, Intel, AMD, AMD. But when I bring it in, I, because I have EVC mode, most of those characteristics didn't matter. But that network card, that might have required different drivers. So that's something that just to be aware of. That LCM with that one driver set could affect whether you can do this or not not just EVC mode. But what we would normally do if we're replacing the hardware is we add all the new nodes and then deprecate out the old nodes. And at that point, we could upgrade the EVC mode in our cluster and take advantage of our new instructions. All right, so none of that changes. You just have to be aware of that hardware characteristic and what drivers are gonna go into your systems, right? So whether you like to hear this or not, the best path going forward might be, you know, I'm replacing old gear, I might have to roll out a new cluster and give it its new characteristics and then migrate my VM workloads. And if you all complain about storage vMotion and vMotioning a couple of VMs, you're just like me and spoiled rotten. So yeah, that's cool that we're complaining about that. But this is an option and this is probably, if nothing changes, this will probably be the best option for hardware that you're going to be purchasing in the next four or five years as you're going to do your, this migration and your next migration. So planning out your, your clusters today that will live that long and making sure that we know that we have these other options given the constraints that are outlined today. And you know, if we're picking hardware, again, that's what this whole example here is. Make sure you're, mix, you're not mixing and matching the different generations of hardware that require different sets of drivers so that as the next versions of vSphere come out, your transition becomes much easier to get there. But you know, building a cluster on its own is not enough, so Will, um, yeah. Designing clusters, so right? Talking, Some of the other things. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about how we see sort of design patterns for sort of how you organize your clusters based on a, a variety of different characteristics. Um, so if you sort of look at, you know, we're going to build out like a bit of a vCenter hierarchy here. So you've got your vCenters, you've got your data center objects, um, but then you get to your hosts and your clusters, and you have to start making decisions about um, how am I going to group, you know, like workloads, uh, what makes sense from a performance and availability perspective. And so if we sort of walk through this, you know, a lot of times we tend to see people consider things like performance and we'll use a, you know, a database workload as an example. We see this as a common design pattern. Sometimes there's licensing constraints here. Like, you know, if you think about like the Oracle example where you have to license a, a, every socket uh, that, that could potentially be scheduled uh, to a particular workload. So we tend to see you know, maybe dedicated Oracle clusters or, or, you know, SQL clusters or things of that nature. Sometimes it's just a Windows or Linux thing. Um, but generally, you know, you're considering performance, you're considering fault tolerance. You know, obviously for mission critical workloads, you want to have higher levels of availability and fault tolerance. Um, Mark, you talked about CPU oversubscription. In, in certain examples, maybe you don't want to do that, right? Because you want to be able to... I want to guarantee performance in my SQL cluster, right? Right. I mean, that runs my company business, so exactly. no oversubscription. But that comes at a high cost, right? It's not practical or realistic to be able to do this for every single workload that you have in your organization. You're going to end up overspending um, and eliminating a lot of the benefits that, that VMware provides inherently uh, and has been providing for a long time. So we tend to see different tiering and, you know, we'll have maybe, you know, you might relax some of these requirements based on, you know, uh, uh, you know lower classification of workloads. Uh, maybe they're not as mission critical. They can, you know, have, you know, downtime or uh, don't require the most expensive disk or the, mo the latest and greatest, you know, processors and those types of things. Um, and then you sort of see, you can just you sort of extrapolate this out. I think the, the, the takeaway here is to really spend time to understand, understand your workloads, understand their relevance to the business, understand how they connect uh, with other things, right? So, you know, things like dependency mapping and sort of understanding traffic flows and all those types of things. What does the business really need important. from IT, right? Yes. I mean, and lining that, the right workload with the right cost. But the problem I see, everyone wants that performance capability <laughs> and this cost. That just doesn't happen. Right. So this is just a good starting point to have that conversation with your, your internal teams, your partners, whoever you're working with to help you design. Uh, have that conversation. Take a picture of this. 
um, you know, this is a great slide to have that conversation as a starting point. So awesome. Uh, hopefully, you know. Wow, we're kicking. We flew through that. Wow. Good. So do you, I don't know if anybody realizes that was 60 slides. So uh, this what this gives us a chance to do uh, is wrap up the stage early and be ready for the next presenters. Um, so we're going to hang out for a few minutes. Yeah. And make sure if you all have questions, we're available to you. And uh, thank you all for coming and giving up your lunch hour. I really appreciate your time. <laughs>